Good evening. Welcome, everyone. My name's Hamish Shelton from HealthCert. I'm in the one in the pink shirt. We have Tony Dicker <laughs> with us. I'll just do a quick introduction before Tony gets started. We have about 45 uh, joining us so far, so we'll let a couple more minutes uh, while the intro for some others to join us. Um, so Tony's going to do a 15-20 uh, minute presentation today on surgery tips for skin cancer surgery below the knee, and we are going to allow as much time, but at least 15 minutes for Q&A. Uh, if you're new to go to webinar, you'll see in the right hand side, in the well, it's, probably, it's on my right hand side, your small little uh, control panel. There's a section for questions. At any time during the webinar, you've got an idea for a question, please feel free to type it. Uh, we won't interrupt Tony at the end of the presentation. We'll then, uh, we'll, I'll then read through the Q and A, uh, and Tony can answer those questions. Um, so just uh, so you're all aware, Tony's a senior lecturer in skin cancer and the course. Co well, Former course coordinator, of the, oh no, course coordinator, Masters of yeah, Medicine Skin right. Cancer at the University of Queensland, not the course coordinator anymore. Um, Tony's a full-time full, full, full -time skin cancer medicine uh, practitioner in Melbourne since 2004, uh, and hopefully you're very familiar. He has taught over 2,000 of our alumni over the past eight or nine years in uh, skin cancer surgery, so uh, I'm sure many of you, uh, he's a familiar face. Um, so now that we've got 50 on board, we'll get started, we'll hand over to Tony. Tony's video isn't working at the same time as the presentation, so we can do a little bit of an intro and then we'll show the slides until the Q&A at the end. Over to you, Tony. Excellent, thank you very much, Hamish. I was gonna change over into sharing my screen and I'll turn off my webcam, like so. So you should all now be able to see the screen, I'm trusting. Good, so tonight's talk is about surgery on the lower leg. Um, just as way of introduction, oops. So what I wanted to cover tonight is directions of closure on the lower leg. Just some people debate as to which way you should close the wounds. Uh, a little bit about antibiotics and when you should use those when doing lower leg lesions. Uh, there was actually a pre-question about dressings. We yes, we plan to cover that and also other aspects about wound care. And also just looking at some other options for closures beyond the primary closure. Uh, when you're doing something on the lower leg. As Hamish just mentioned, I'm a skin cancer doctor. I work in Cheltenham in Melbourne, uh, Victoria. My background training is actually in dermatology. So I started as a dermatology registrar up in Brisbane, did my time up there as well as doing my PhD up there. Uh, and I started the Sunspot Skin Cancer Clinics down in Melbourne in 2005. Uh, ran those for about 12, 13 years. Then I took on the role of CEO for Australian Skin Cancer Clinics we just stepped down from about a year and a half ago. So I'm now having the luxury of just being a doctor once more. Well, being a doctor plus doing a lot of teaching because I do quite enjoy the teaching part of things. So directions of closure, I'm talking about ellipses here, um, but obviously the directions of closure are relevant for flaps and graphs as well, or more so for flaps. So in terms of options for directions of closure, uh, we can look at wrinkle lines, which I thought was uh, first described by Kreisel um, versus Langer's lines, and Langer designed these lines by doing punch biopsies in corpses and seeing which directions um, the, the wound naturally closed. But also more recently described by uh, Dr. Sherrod Paul from New Zealand, a surgeon over in New Zealand, who some of you may well know, uh, the idea of best lines. And he's described by best lines as these biodynamic lines. And he's done a lot of work in the last five to 10 years looking at skin tension and directions of closure in different parts of the body. So this is the article recently written by Shara, this is back in 2017. And this is actually free online. So best lines is biodynamic excisional skin tension lines. Uh, so you can search for this and have a read through the entire article. And this is his article about things in the lower leg and the tension on the lower leg, which is quite interesting. Um, what he's found is that the least tension for a wound that is more than eight millimeters can be different to the wrinkle lines. So if you're making an incision and then you close the wound, often the wrinkle lines are the best direction to go. If you're doing an excision and therefore have to pull the wound together, the best direction of closure is different to your wrinkle lines. Um, so I'd certainly recommend those who want to do further study of this area, this is worth reading about. But the main thing from this paper, well, there's two probably main things to it, but um, if we take a uh, BC, an SCC like this, so here's a lesion on a calf, 
Um, we've taken a biopsy off this, which came back as squamous cell carcinoma. And so we're now planning our excision of this lesion on the lower calf. This is a 15 centimetre diameter lesion. And what you can see in this drawing is that I've got the wrinkle line direction drawn in, whilst I've drawn the ellipse in a vertical direction. So what Sharad showed on the lower leg is that the best direction for closure for an ellipse, if you're looking at minimising tension, uh, your best direction actually is vertical. So I'd recommend you try doing vertical excisions most times on the lower leg. While up until recently, I used to have them on an angle which was more matching those wrinkle lines. But he's done that formal study as part of his PhD studies with University of Queensland, showing that the a vertical line has got less tension across it to close it compared to a wrinkle line. And that can save you a lot of times, that bit of extra tension relief can make life a lot easier to close a tight wound. So first of all, yes, I suggest you try doing vertical excisions in this sort of direction rather than the wrinkle lines. The second thing I was going to talk to you about in regards to closing these wounds, which can be quite tight at times, obviously, is this sort of pulley suture. And often uh, we teach these during the skin cancer surgery course um, in the introduction course. So if you have a look here, there's uh, about 10 sutures across the wound, but there's only five knots. And so these sutures have been placed where the, for each time you've tied a knot, there's actually two loops of a suture through the skin. And that just helps pull the skin together uh, so the knot doesn't slip as much when you're closing the wound. For these tighter wounds, I tend to start at the two edges and work my way to the middle. But also make sure there's a good even spread of tension across the whole wound as a consequence. So an even spread of tension and sometimes more sutures as a consequence will give you a better uh, result. There's less tearing of the skin as a consequence. Uh, but this, this pulley suture just helps make it makes it easier to get the wound closed together side to side. The other pulley suture you might have seen is more of a cross across the skin. Uh, in this circumstance, effectively the cross is underneath the skin uh, rather than on the surface. And this is what we talk about during the uh, skin cancer surgery uh, sessions on those weekend courses. So that's a straightforward part about uh, lower leg wounds when you're doing ellipses. The next question is often about antibiotics. Do I need to give antibiotics for wounds on lower legs? And certainly there's um, many publications showing that the rates of infection on lower legs is higher than other parts of the body. So our tendency is towards uh, antibiotics for lower legs. Um, however, it doesn't need it every single time. It varies in different regions of the country. So in a moist, humid environment of northern Queensland, there's more likely issues in regards to um, sweating of the wound and then secondary infection compared to the southern climes of Victoria and Tasmania. So in most cases, antibiotics aren't needed. So it shouldn't be just a routine that everybody gets them. Um, you pick your targets rather than giving out as a, a routine thing for lower legs especially for ellipses, when you're doing something more complicated to close the lesion, that makes you more inclined to use antibiotics. When you're giving antibiotics, we're doing it as antibiotic prophylaxis. So we're not trying to treat an existing wound infection, uh, we're preventing a wound infection happening. And so that's a single dose before surgery. Now, most of the guidelines regarding antibiotic prophylaxis are usually relating to abdominal uh, surgery or brain surgery or cardiac surgery, joint surgery, and they're usually giving a single dose of intravenous antibiotics because they're sedating the patient and putting them to sleep, so it's an easy thing to do. But in fact, we're not going to be doing that sort of thing. We're going to give an oral dose. So it does need a time for absorption, so it does need at least 60 minutes and probably preferably 90 minutes before the surgery. My typical dose is going to be a gram of cephalexin. Um, so very simple, you give them a prescription for some uh, cephalexin, 500 milligram tablets, and you ask them to have two tablets about an hour and a half before the plain surgery time. And that way they've been absorbed through their gut, they're running through their bloodstream, they're active in the right place. So if you're pushing any bugs into the wound during your surgical procedure, 
uh, effective the antibiotics are there to catch those at the right time. Remember that skin surgery is clean surgery, not sterile surgery. Even though we wipe down the skin surface uh, with some antibiotics, so with, with an alcohol wipe at the start, um, we've still got bacteria down here, follicles, is, we're not ablating all of the bacteria. So there's still normal bacteria around the surface. Uh, we don't use topical antibiotics for this, we use oral antibiotics, because if we're using a topical antibiotic, what we're likely to do is then generate some resistant antibiotics, resistant uh, bacteria on the wound instead. We only use our full course of uh, antibiotics when there actually is a wound infection, not as a prevention for infections. Now it varies patient to patient, of course. Um, so if you've got an immunosuppressed patient with diabetes, you're much more likely to give antibiotics. But for a younger healthy person, and even an older healthy person with good circulation, you may not need the antibiotics. So make a case by case decision, but don't, um, don't give it every single time. In terms of dressings, well, yes, this would be overkill. Um, we don't need to have this sort of size plasters and everything else like that, of course. But what are some of the basic rules for dressings on the lower legs? Well, again, we've got a, a clean wound. Most times when we're uh, doing excisions, uh, we're not cutting through an infected wound. And we've usually got a dry wound because we've closed it side to side. So with a clean and a dry wound, uh, a simple occlusive dressing is all that should be required. We've often got some steri strips to help support the wound because there's a degree of tension on the lower leg. And so we've put our sutures through to close the wound. We can use some steri strips on the outside of that to sort of widen the, the areas of tension so that not all the pull is on the actual suture points themselves. Uh, and then we use some compression to also help keep the wound closed. So we're, we're, diverting the tension away from just being on the sutures themselves. The second part of compression, of course, is it stops or it causes less edema of the lower leg. As people stand up all day, there's a lot of swelling uh, occurring in lower legs. And therefore, by having the compression, we're minimizing that edema, therefore minimizing the stretching on the wound. We also, of course, want to plan the post-operative care, and it's actually important that you, especially on lower legs, you plan that before the day of surgery, not on the day of surgery. So it's not uncommon that people uh, will come in ready for an operation, they say, oh now, by the way, doc, it's okay if I play golf tomorrow, isn't it? And you're going, ah, uh, that could be a problem, but I've got the championships tomorrow, I'm in the quarterfinals, I can't just not play. And I've had people actually have cancelled their surgery on the day because they didn't want to miss out on their golf tournament or their bowls event or whatever function was coming up. So that's a conversation you have at the time of your consultation when you're making the diagnosis. And I had two of those conversations today with patients when I was doing my consulting. I said, right, we're going to do this lesion and these are the things that we need to make sure you're not doing after the surgery um, so that we have some good wound healing. As well as the planning before the day of the surgery, um, clear instructions to match the person's activity. So you ask them what they do. Are you a golfer? Do you run a lot? What sort of gym work do you do? All those activity type questions. Yeah, you know, maybe a general question. What's, what are your normal daily activities? What do you normally do during the day? Well, they'll help guide you saying, okay, well, for golf, no, you shouldn't be playing golf for a week. Or for bowls, no, I don't want you standing up for four hours bowling. Uh, maybe a light role, but you shouldn't play a full game. And it, be able to adjust their activities in terms and, and conversations that make sense to them, I suppose is the idea. And the final part of that, of course, is um, when you finish the surgery, give them written instructions about how to look after it as well. So it shouldn't be just your verbal instructions because they forget those things. You should have some pre-printed sheets that every patient receives on leaving the surgery. Uh, talking about how they're going to use ice to minimise um, their swelling, minimise their pain, minimise the bleeding, how they leave their dressings intact, what to do if they have some problems in terms of heat and soreness and things suggesting uh, potential wound infection. Uh, if it's all written down, uh, they've got a much better chance of being able to do what's correct if the circumstances arise in terms of complications, but also the much better chance of actually managing the wound correctly. 
So I'd encourage you all to have a, a pre-written sheet about wound care uh, for, to give to all your patients. Elevation is really helpful. And I often use the example on the right, if you can walk around doing a handstand all day, that is the best way you can manage your lower leg lesion. Not quite a practical option, of course, uh, but I also give them permission to put their feet up on the couch. Um, so elevating just a little bit, and my general rule for them to make it easy is heel above bum. Uh, that gives them a chance of actually um, understanding what to do. And just encourage that any time you're sitting down, please just put your feet up. Don't leave them hanging down. Yes, getting home in the car for 10 minutes or 15 minutes, your feet will be hanging down. If practical, sit in the back seat and put your feet up on the back seat if that's going to be an option for you on the way home from surgery. So just little hints like that, and they can then take that and extrapolate to their life, I suppose, is the idea there. Just to finish up uh, for our little 15-minute talk, um, other options beyond ellipses. Uh, so there's many options. This is not the full list. This is probably my first round of go-tos. Um, so there are other flaps you can do. There's other complicated repairs you can do. Most of the time, I'm still closing my lower leg lesions with simple ellipses, and especially things that are less than two centimeters across, and that's the defect size. Virtually all of those can be closed with an ellipse. Uh, if it's less than two centimetres and doesn't want to move an ellipse, it's usually because they've got really edematous, cruddy legs, um, and therefore not much else is going to move either. So if it's a matter of they've got a small lesion but poor mobility of their skin, there's usually not a flap that's going to work and you're pretty much going to a graft. Whether that's a split skin graft or a modification of it, uh, that being a halo graft, uh, you tend to go for a thin graft, so a split graft, rather than a full thickness graft. And that's more to do with the circulation uh, below the knee. For a full thickness graft to take, you'd need good blood flow. As a general rule, people who are growing skin cancers on their lower legs haven't got good circulation, so less likely for a full thickness graft to work. Probably my main go-to for lower legs now um, if the ellipse isn't going to close is a keystone flap. And these are one of the flaps that's uh, taught during the advanced surgery courses uh, on the weekend courses. But there's also the option of a reducing opposed multi-lobed flap or ROM flap. That's sort of multiple sort of circles and they sort of overlap each other to close the flap. But more recently, that's the second thing that's described in that paper I showed you of Sharon's before, a fascia release. And so another thing that Sharon showed in his paper is that rather than actually having to do a keystone and release the fascia, if you make a simple uh, incision down to the fascia and release the fascia, uh, that actually gives an equivalent amount of movement of the skin as what a keystone does. And by chance in his trial, he had one patient who had two lesions, uh, one on each calf of a similar sort of size. And on one leg, he uh, was able to uh, do a keystone on the other leg, he's able to just do a fascia release. And he found he got the same tension relief from a fascia release compared to a keystone. Now, it was a trial of one. It's hard to know how you elaborate from that. But the circumstances were on the same individual human being. So it gives a bit of a control in regards to their tension. He was giving similar tension relief for the fascia release compared to a keystone. Good. I'm going to leave it there as our general discussions. That's about 15 minutes, and we're going to go back to my camera. I hope. Good. Thank you, Tony. And yes. Hamish, do we have any questions? We have three questions. So just before I get those started, please feel free to uh, to add some more in. Uh, there's you'll find the question panel down in the bottom of your, uh, on the control panel for GoToWebinar, you can just click the little arrow next to the word questions and you should be able to uh, to enter your own question. Um, so Tony, we've got three, I'll start just go through them in the order that they came. Uh, this is the one I think you referred to earlier on, one of the options for skin cancer is more than three centimetres on shin and foot other than skin grafts. 
options uh, for things more than three centimetres. I, I suppose the first starting point there in a primary care setting, because um, most of us are working in a general practice type environment, if the lesion's more than three centimetres, are you actually insured to cut those out? Because a lot of the insurance companies do put a criteria of three centimetres for the size of the lesion that's covered. So that's one thing to consider first of all. So the second follow on from that, is it something that should be done in primary care or it should be done in a hospital setting anyway, um, where they can be resting up for a couple of days after the surgery. So that's the first starting point for things more than three centimetres. But then, yes, my usual go-to is still the keystone in that circumstance. And uh, Professor Bayer, who described a lot of work at the keystone, has done eight and 10 centimetre lesions with keystones. He does some very large procedures where he uh, moves an entire neurovascular unit to cover up a defect. He does some very extensive plastic surgery. This is not what we do in primary care, of course. Um, but his descriptions of what you can do with a keystone are quite impressive and it's worth seeing his book regarding that. Uh, but probably uh, your best option is still a split graft for a very large lesion. Thank you, and we've got a few more questions coming in, so we'll go through them uh, relatively quickly. Does the vertical ellipse, oops, my screen's moved. Does someone put a question in? Let me make that bigger. Does the vertical ellipse also apply to the anterior shin above the angle? Yes, it does. Oh. Yes, so anterior or posterior, not just for over the calf, but even anterior, uh, you're better off in a vertical uh, direction in terms of what the best lines are. So it's all aspects of the lower leg, anything below the knee, the best lines were vertical lines. That doesn't apply to the foot, sorry, that's between the ankle and the knee. Thank you. Uh, would you put dermal stitches in all the time? I try to when I can, but often the skin or the dermis is too thin to take a dermal suture. So yes, they're very useful to relieve tension, uh, but you need a tissue that can hold the dermal suture. And the fat layer and the fascia aren't strong enough to hold the dermal sutures. So if you've got a thick enough dermis, then yes, it's worth applying or worth using some dermal sutures, but a lot of the time in lower legs, there's just not enough thickness of dermis to be able to replace them. Thank you. Um, does a halo not replace bad skin with bad skin? That's the potential. That's one of the risks of the halo graft. So you shouldn't do halo grafts for melanomas because one of our issues with melanomas is occasionally the the cells are drifting away from the visible lesion and you might be transplanting melanoma cells back into the middle of the wound. Um, it, it's a pick on what the skin around the area is like. Some people have just got a layer of crust and debris and therefore there's no good skin around the lesion to take to put into the wound. But other lesions are quite isolated as single squamous cells and there's reasonable skin around it, which is suitable to graft with. But yes, if there's not uh, suitable quality skin next to the lesion, it tend to be taking it from the inner thigh as a standard split graft. Or you can effectively do the same thing as a halo graft where you take multiple small pieces rather than one big sheet um, from your donor site on the upper thigh as well. And that's often something similar to what a pinch graft is where they put lots of little pieces into the wound instead. So multiple small pieces is still acceptable. It's usually easier placing one single piece for a split skin graft rather than multiple pieces. And another related to halo grafts, uh, doctor says I've been doing the um, I've been doing the pressure dressing left on for a week at a time for two weeks. But after that, what do you usually dress with? Often it's still a bit raw with a halo graft. Yeah. So for all of my grafts, whichever part of the body, uh, I tend to be seeing them weekly and do my dressings weekly. So I'll have them back at one week, have them back at two weeks. And you're right, it's not fully healed at the two week mark, but there's a fair amount of strength to the wound at that stage. Uh, 
I'm usually just recovering for the third week and after the third week I'm taking the dressings down. So especially lower legs, that's slower area to heal. My dressings are usually three weeks being changed on a weekly basis. Thank you. Next, um, BCC slash SCC, what is the current recommendation about margin? Yeah, so the new uh, guidelines for non-melanoma skin cancer should be out in the next month or two. They're now called the keratinocyte cancer guidelines rather than non-melanoma skin cancer guidelines. So there should be something about those very soon publicly. Um, it varies. So there's a variety of studies talking about margins around skin cancers. So for basal cells, the recommended margins are anywhere between two millimetres and eight millimetres. Uh, so some studies have sort of used Mohs surgery and found that uh, they can still identify tumour cells wider than what we'd expect. But I'm not sure how reliable some of those studies actually are in terms of their technique, what they've been doing and how they've been measuring things. So certainly the, the guidelines are a good starting point. Now these are clinical margins rather than histological margins, that's important. So if you clinically measure off four millimetres around a BCC and then you find that the histology comes back saying you're clear by two millimetres, that's still an adequate margin. You don't have to have four millimetres histologically, it's four millimetres clinically and histological clearance is your objective. Uh, for squamous cell, again, there's, there's sort of differences in their clinical appearance. You'll see some squamous cell carcinomas which are very well circumscribed. What you see is what you get. And you can draw a small margin around that and you know confidently that the whole lesion is going to be cleared. Other lesions drift from obvious squamous cell into probably squamous cell into intraepidermal carcinoma into sun damaged skin. And they're the ones where you tend to be going into a wider margin to make sure you've got all of the actual tumour. But it's often three to five millimetres of what's your confidence, the squamous cell component, uh, as your margin around a squamous cell carcinoma. Thank you. Um, just uh, so another couple of cases by a doctor. It took six weeks for a simple four millimetre punch biopsy, a punch biopsy I did on the lower legs to heal in a 58 year old female with no comor comorbidities. In a different patient, another 85 year old man whom I did a shave biopsy on the forearm of one centimetre took six weeks to heal. What biopsy do you recommend for quicker healing? I don't judge my type of biopsy based on the healing, I base it on where the pathology is. So I'll take a punch biopsy if I think there's a certain depth to the lesion. So inflammatory lesions on the lower leg or any part of the body, I want to see the lower dermis or I want to show the pathologist the lower dermis so they can make a judgment on the reaction patterns. On a squamous cell carcinoma, if I'm worried about the depth of the lesion, uh, I'll take a punch biopsy so that I can uh, identify how deep the lesion is. Most of my biopsies are shave biopsies uh, because most of the time the pathology is all uh, epidermal or very high dermal, so papillary dermis. The lesion thickness is often only about a millimetre and therefore taking a shave biopsy gives most of the tissue of relevance or the ab abnormal tissue to the pathologist so they can make, make a better interpretation. I don't try to judge my biopsy based on ways of healing, I base it on uh, what the pathologist needs to see. Thank you. Um, what tension lines cutting do you recommend in the thigh area? Yeah, so the studies, the studies haven't been done on the thigh uh, regarding best lines that I've seen. Pr probably Sherrod has measured some things on the thigh, uh, but there's usually a lot less lesions on the thigh. I've tended to follow wrinkle lines at this stage. I haven't tried doing uh, vertical lines on the thigh. Um, so I, I've, my habit's still been wrinkle lines on the thigh where they're coming across a bit of an angle. But I haven't seen any data about best lines on the thigh. You mentioned earlier around the fascia release. The question is how to do a fascia, fascia release. Yes, good. So the uh, the actual 
technique is really well described in Sharon's paper. So it's just simple, and it's a free online publication. Um, so I'd recommend you do actually get that publication and read it. <coughs> Apologies for that. Um, because it actually does describe it very nicely. And rather than me trying to describe it again, I think you're better off just reading it directly. You will organise, um, Tony, if you can just, so I've got to make sure we get the right paper. We'll uh, include that link when we send out the email to the um, replay of this uh, of this webinar. All right, we've yes. still got a few more questions. And that's um, also on the, um, that, that actual publication is on that slide number three of this webinar anyway, so people can pause the okay. recording and see the actual paper. Yep, and we'll, uh, we'll try and include a URL to make it uh, easy for yep. everyone to download. Looks like we have about six questions to go, so uh, we're on our 30 minute mark, but um, they're all very uh, interesting and valuable. Um, so we'll just uh, quickly run through the rest. What care should be taken for suturing lower limbs on patients with peripheral vascular disease? Uh, what's different for peripheral vascular disease compared to those who haven't got it? Um, we know their risk of infection is slightly higher, so we consider antibiotics. Um, their peripheral vascular disease doesn't directly relate to how thick or thin their skin is, uh, but they may have very thin skin and if we have more trouble putting in dermal sutures, there are more issues with tearing. Um, the ischemia side of things, I, I don't alter my uh, use of adrenaline for peripheral vascular disease for the area between the ankle and the knee, uh, but I'm certainly much more cautious when I'm doing things on the feet uh, when there's significant uh, peripheral vascular disease. Probably more to do with the aftercare than anything else is making sure they're, they're very strict in their resting up of their legs afterwards. Um, but if you're getting to the stage where they're quite compromised and you're concerned about risks uh, as part of the healing, we refer. We don't have to do everything in primary care. Uh, it may well be appropriate they are managed in a hospital setting uh, and therefore that's an appropriate time to refer them off to someone who can admit them to hospital, do the procedure, have a couple of days bed rest to make sure everything's stable before they go home. Thank you. Um, Dr. Hoffman said, I've used a burrows graft on the lower leg using the triangles of the ellipse excise to close ellipses with good success when the ellipse does not close completely. Yeah, so um, you, you want to make it a fairly thin um, Burroughs graft. If you try to do a full thickness graft in the lower leg, you've got less chance of it taking completely. By taking those two triangles at the end of the ellipse, um, you, you want to make sure that certainly all of the fat's been removed, but you also want to thin out some of the dermis if you can, rather than having a full thickness graft. But that does certainly work, um, where you can cl partially close the two ends of the ellipse that you've created um, and then you can use those two triangles in the middle. It's it's a, another way of getting some donor tissue for a graft. The other issue there of course is making sure that your two ends don't have any residual tumour in there. So the advantage of taking an ellipse is at least you know two of the directions of the lesion are well clear of the margins, you're only worried about the lateral margins. Uh, if you've then converted that ellipse into a circle that's been removed then there's a bit more chance of um, one of the two ends of those triangles actually having some residual disease still present. Thank you. Uh, do you use diuretics to shift fluid? I don't. I use pressure. Um, pressure and elevation uh, is, a, is my preference for how I'd manage it. So I don't get involved in their general medical care. I'm, I'm only working in a skin cancer clinic. Uh, I, I don't work in general practice otherwise. But I've certainly had a couple of occasions where someone's come in with quite edematous legs, who's meant to be wearing stockings, who tells me, oh, it's too hot and too hard or whatever else the usual reasons are. And I've reinforced with them the importance um, pre-surgery to get rid of their peripheral edema and had a two week strict use of their stockings. And on a number of occasions, when I expected to be putting a graft on their lower leg, and I've explained to them we're going to put a graft on and everything else, 
after two weeks of removing their edema, I've been able to close the wound with a simple ellipse. They've had a much better healing outcome, much easier time uh, with their leg by that pre-operative um, compression stockings. All right, we'll take two more questions, maybe till the 10 minute mark, and uh, then we'll, uh, we can keep the others and take them offline, Tony. Um, what histological clearance margins are acceptable for BCCs and SCCs and melanomas? There's no good studies about what margin should be taken for those histologically. Um, so at least a millimetre. Uh, so for basal cell carcinomas, there's some studies which have looked at incomplete margins where there's still, uh, the report says that the BCC is touching the margin and they've still observed the lesion rather than re-excising. And about one third to two thirds of the time, the lesion recurs, which also means that at least a third of the time, the lesion doesn't recur when the report was touching a histological margin. So you could say that for BCCs, one option is zero. Um, however, most people like to get down to the, at least a millimetre margin around a BCC. Uh, John Pine recently published a paper looking at squamous cell carcinomas and um, he looked at uh, histologically clear lesions and they measured how clear they were and he followed up his patients for a number of years afterwards and looked at recurrence despite having a clear histological margin uh, and he found that even a two millimetre histological margin was not always adequate especially for a poorly differentiated lesion. So John Pine's got a paper on squamous cell carcinoma histological margins, and it um, shows nicely that even three millimetres histologically is only just enough in some circumstances, but a well differentiated lesion behaves in a different way to a poorly differentiated lesion. And the chance of a well differentiated lesion becoming metastatic is low, but a poorly differentiated lesion that's a significant risk of actually becoming metastatic rather than just recurrent in the lesion. So you want to get a, a definite comfortable margin for a polydifferentiated lesion. For a melanoma, um, again, there's no good studies about how many millimetres clear we should be. The, the guidelines are clinical margins rather than histological. Um, and again, it depends on the lesion. Some melanomas are very well circumscribed and under the microscope, you can see exactly where it stops and starts. Others, especially in tetanus lesions, there's a drifting at the edge and even the pathologist can't easily pick where it stops and where it starts. And so you need to have that discussion with the pathologist about how confident do they feel the edges are in terms of clearance. And for a litiginous drifting lesion, you'd want to have at least two millimetres histologically, if not more. All right, and um, we've still got two minutes before our 40 minutes, what should we do if a lower leg excision gets infected and difficult to heal, even in three months? Any steps you would follow other than treating with antibiotics and using, it says TEDS, um, yep. thanks. TEDS stockings, yep. So if someone's not healing despite normal uh, care for an infected wound, you've got to start thinking what else is going on. So that's when you start looking into are they in some other way immunocompromised? That might just be their diabetes and diabetes control might make a difference there. Is there some other sort of low grade blood dyscrasia going on is worth considering? Because that can occasionally happen. I've had a couple of people whose low grade blood disorders have been diagnosed because they've had uh, poor healing and wound infections too easily for no obvious reason. So that's when you start thinking about um, is there some other underlying medical illness going on for the patient? And the third factor, of course, is are they actually doing what you're asking them to do? Uh, are they truly resting up and uh, letting the wound recover? Or are they out drinking every night and dancing? Uh, that's again where the written instructions come into it, where they might sort of half listen to what um, you're saying, but then uh, they don't actually follow your instructions and then their wound doesn't heal. Uh, it'd be my other advice, but certainly obviously the oral antibiotics and the support stockings, the TED stockings are the, the first line treatment for the infections.
And the final one, Tony, uh, any concerns with kid, for kids with lesions and future growth issues? Kids with lesions and future growth issues? Um, no is the answer. Um, as children grow, uh, their skin grows with them. Um, as our bellies grow out, our, our bellies somehow cope with us gaining weight as well. Um, so we're not affecting the bone. We're not going to affect any growth plate. We're only con uh, doing things on the skin. Now, I don't take many things off uh, the lower legs of children because it's pretty rare for them to get skin cancer in the first place. And most of the nevi in the lower legs are pretty small, innocuous ones in the first place. So if there's a reason to cut a skin lesion off a lower leg of a child, that shouldn't affect their growth otherwise. They certainly, their scar will stretch with them is the only thing to be aware of that their, their scar will get longer as they get taller. Excellent. And that is the last question and so we'll wrap it up. Um, so thank you, Tony. Thank, thank you very you. much for, uh, for joining us and sharing your uh, wisdom and answering those questions. Thank you everyone else for, uh, on behalf of HealthCert for, for joining us for this webinar. Uh, we will send out the recording to everyone. Um, and if you do, uh, if you haven't attended the course with Tony, Tony is the uh, presenter, the key presenter and built the professional certificate of skin cancer surgery along with HealthCert. He presents it uh, four times a year going forward, but he's got a uh, next one's coming up at the end of November or the last day of November, first day of December. So there's still an opportunity in Sydney to, to attend that course this year. And then going forward, Will, he's running the course in Melbourne, the Gold Coast, Sydney, and then Brisbane. Uh, and alongside those, if you have done Tony's course uh, and you are interested, we also run the more advanced certificate and then the expert workshop. So Tony, thank you again. I'll uh, end the webinar and look forward to- I was going to say, Hamish, that one of the advanced surgical uh, workshops is focusing on the lower leg. So if you're having trouble with lower leg lesions and you've already completed my course, then one of the courses taught by Alistair and Tony Azzi uh, is on lower legs as well. Excellent. And if you do need any more information on that, please um, feel free to email info at healthcert.com or visit healthcert.com on the website. There's information on all of those courses and I'll be happy to provide uh, more information and uh, look forward to uh, Tony having you join us uh, sometime uh, in the future. Thank you very much.